Welcome everyone to the Our Packages Book Club. Tonight we are speaking with Jenny Bryan, uh, one of the co-authors of the book, of the second edition of the book, um, and the maintainer of the Use This Package, which is my personal favorite package. Um, and tonight she's going to answer some of our questions about uh, packages and anything else are related that kind of fits in that general theme. Um, all right, so, uh, and I will paste this one more time for the people who just joined. We have a link to a Slido uh, board. If you haven't used Slido before, it lets you ask a question or um, importantly, vote on questions that are already there. And uh, that way I can kind of see what people want to see answered. Um, also, since there aren't a ton of us, um, like as we go, if you have uh, like, once we get going, if you have things that you would like to um, hear about, don't speak up quite yet, but um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll probably make this pretty informal because there aren't a, a billion of us in here. All right, yeah, but I'm gonna start. I, I oh, hope it ahead. doesn't feel like Q A, Q -A <laughs> right. but like a discussion. Maybe discussion <laughs> if people. Um, so yeah, I would thoughts. say. I'll just go ahead and say that that I mean there aren't there aren't enough of us that it's going to be a problem. So if you have yeah. like a follow up, if you want to discuss something that comes up, um, chime in. Uh, I will. I'll try to like steer us back if we get too far in the weeds. But whatever, like whatever we talk about is what we talk about. So, um, the first one, the one that's uh, up here at the top, is uh, Colin, who was our wonderful facilitator for this book club. Uh, wants to know, or it says that finding ways to contribute to open source packages can be daunting. Um, how do you, like, what what process do you have when you're first, like, looking at a new project that you might be involved in, a new package to kind of um, understand it and, and figure out where you can contribute? I think that's, that is a really good question. It's a really <laughs> hard question. We have actually talked about this in our group recently or we, we have a book club we started our own uh, yeah. book club software engineering book club that's sort of tidyverse tidy models team um and i don't feel like we've really reached a conclusion <laughs> which is you know hello package abc like where do you start because I know for damn sure you don't want to open the R directory and start reading the files in alphabetical order, right? <laughs> right? Which is in some sense kind of feels like the most natural thing to do because you're like pretty sure that the R folder is the business end of the package. And then because we're plagued by alphabetical ordering, it, it sort of feels like maybe you should just start clicking on the files and reading them. And I know that does not work very well. Um, so at this point, like when I, for some reason, like need to become involved in a package, either <laughs> because I've been told I'm the maintainer of it, or, <laughs> um, I, I need to like understand something so that I can maybe file a bug report or a feature request, but I, I want to be like a little bit educated. Um, I think I'm very sort of issue driven. So usually the way I find my like entry point is that there's gonna be like a particular function or a particular behavior of a particular function that like interests me or that I think is wrong or something like that. <laughs> and then you start like peeling the onion. Um, so you call it, maybe you put a debug on it. If, you're, if you know you're gonna be developing if you know you're gonna make a PR eventually, you know you just go ahead and you get the source. I'm a big fan of putting a lot of browser statements in um, and, and discover in that way, like this calls this and this calls this and oh, wow, this seems to be a very important class. Let me go read about that class. But I, I try to find some kind of like organic piece of usage that I'm interested in and then just pull that thread. Um, that's, and, and but I, I can't say that's feels fantastic all of the time because 
you know, Pat, you know, books are meant to be read, right? Like there's a beginning, a middle and an end, or like you're told it's a reference book and, and it's kind of clear how to go to a particular place. Packages are not meant to be read. And so it is, I think, fundamentally kind of awkward. But so <laughs> I th think the right entry point is through usage. Um, and then that kind of reveals important functions and classes and sort of concepts. Um, anyway, that's that's my best <laughs> take at it. I don't know if any anyone has a different concrete approach that they take because there are very um, few packages with like design documents that's it's like a, dr a dream when you find <laughs> that though um, right i've in use this i've actually created something called like principles or something like yeah i think like that at the top level and it's you know our build ignored because it's you know not an official part of a package but where um i write down kind of like this is how we do things around here like for example at some point oh. we decided that that all file path handling had to go through the fs package and we were just like all in on fs and the way it handles home directory and all sorts of stuff um and so you know, we, wrote, we wrote that down uh, and then we've also like built in uh guardrails that make it almost impossible to well it does make it impossible to use um base our file system functions. So I'm not advocating that particular practice, but more that like when you make these kind of policy decisions or like we always turn this into this kind of object, um, especially when I've like I inherited use of this and so I have sort of gradually been imposing my opinions on <laughs> it. Um, so there's been a lot of like discovery <laughs> what was already there and like why it was there. Um, I have found starting to write stuff like that down helpful if you've really got like a long-term relationship with a package. I, I don't think you would do that for, you know, to make a pull request, but. Have you thought about uh, like building a framework for that into use this? Uh, no, cause it's <laughs> such a, I feel like it's a very squishy task and, and I certainly maintain right. packages where I have not felt moved to create right. such a document. Um, so I don't think it it's universally applicable. Fair enough. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that kind of fits with one that I had in here of um, when you have an idea for like a new package or a new functional area within a package or, a, or just a new function, um, how do you decide whether that is something you'll actually do or, you know, maybe you'll write an issue about it and it's just kind of in the background or maybe you'll just say, no, we're never going to do that. Like, how do you decide um, the scope, I guess, uh, or I guess it's kind of two separate things. So one is how do you decide to add a new thing and then how, versus like a brand new package? So the adding a new thing. Um... I think we really weigh like how much code am I going to have to add and therefore like increase my attack surface for bugs versus how much more delightful and capable is this package going to feel, right? Because um, sometimes people ask for things like it's not a bad idea, but there aren't going to be a lot of people using it and it's very fussy code to write. So it would make that one person really happy and it would totally be like a net gain for them. But for like the ecosystem, it is a net loss because, you know, if I or whoever the maintainer is, is writing this, I'm not writing something else. And if I'm coming back to this one kind of fussy, brittle thing over and over again that isn't used by many people, that's also like there's an opportunity cost. So that kind of feels bad sometimes when you have to tell people like your idea is not bad, but it like it does not hit the sweet spot of, of what I think. And that's always a judgment call. The sort of utility gain would be versus the, the sort of maintainer debt 
we are taking on <laughs> by implementing it. Um, so of course, you know, fixing bugs, <laughs> like <laughs> if I've already told, signed a contract with you that I'm willing to do X, then it's like pretty important that I do X. So those are those are easy, right? In many cases, unless it's a really weird edge case that you're like, I just accept that I have that bug. <laughs> um, but when it comes more to new features and functions or new functions, um, yeah, it's really like how adjacent does it feel to like what we're already doing, what we've already promised, how, elegantly do I think I could implement it and therefore it would be pretty maintainable it would be testable and then some totally subjective guess at like how many <laughs> people would actually use it that, that totally makes sense um how about uh I guess and maybe more than just you but how, how does the the collective you uh decide on a brand new package like, is that a bigger, bigger decision? I, I would assume somewhat of a bigger decision. Is there a process For or is it just sure. kind of, it's time, you know? In our, in our group, it feels fairly informal. <laughs> There's not like a once a year, like everybody nominate three new package <laughs> ideas and we're going to vote or something like that. Um, and I guess I'm maybe particularly the wrong one to ask because I am like, I do a lot of like maintenance work and keeping existing things mm -hmm. running. Um, so it's rare for me, but it's kind of, it's not rare for all of it. It's kind of rare for all of us to like have a green field right. to go on. So I, there is some of that, but at least in our group, we, we do have like a lot of coverage in lots of parts of the problem space. So it feels like even when we create new packages, you know, some newer ones are like vectors. It's it's kind of part of refactoring the ecosystem, right? It's like realizing right. that like, here's something we've been doing in a sort of DIY way across a whole bunch of packages. It would make more sense. So that's definitely a new package, but it's not like a new problem space. It's realizing that something needs to be pulled out of a lot of packages, put in a common place, hardened, and then used elsewhere. And, you know, Arlang is like, I think another example of that, where like it's, it's way newer than dplyr and tidyr and pur <laughs> and all of that, but, it's to power all those other packages in a more consistent way. Right. Um, <laughs> I guess maybe, you know, Google Sheets 4 was maybe, maybe that's the most recent, like completely new thing I've worked on. And that was replacing an older package right. who's, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. That will presumably come up in some <laughs> of these other questions. I had no idea what I was doing when I wrote that package. Um, it was like amazing that it worked as well as it did. Um, but so Google Sheets 4, like it was definitely new, but I was basically, I was basically solving the same problem, but just with a lot more skill, <laughs> skills. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I don't, I don't live in a world of like a lot of sort of right. greenfield projects. Um, well, how about, um, I don't know, I don't know the, like when you came in on use this, but what was the decision point to make use this exist versus, I think, I mean, it, it like split off of dev tools. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, do you know <laughs> why that happened? Well, like, so I have this vision that like the dev tools was like, three toddlers in a trench coat or something like it's it was this <laughs> it was this like kind of crazy contraption that had like all sorts of different jobs in various ways and and so the idea was to like we need to take these toddlers out of the trench coat and like <laughs> and then and then there is there is still though the toddlers like it is still this storefront for a lot of different functionality um so i guess the decision that this needed to happen to dev tools was either before my time or before I was working on that 
part of our ecosystem. Like I, I maybe I was still off, like only working on read Excel. And I might've been pretty new to our studio then. Um, but I feel like I was just sort of told that the decision had been made that we needed to have what was called the conscious uncoupling of dev tools, which of course refers to Gwyneth Paltrow's, the end of her marriage, they called it yeah. a conscious uncoupling that it's, it's amicable. It's like a mature <laughs> decision. Um, so a lot of smaller micro packages were carved out of dev tools, but like use this got a huge chunk of right. stuff, like the biggest. And then of course, dev tools and Roxygen are pre-existing big chunks who are partially exposed in dev tools. But then like our command check, um, I should think of more, but like very purpose, super specific packages, rev dev check got split off right. from it. And it made them, it made them easier to maintain. And it meant they could get bug fixes and new features faster because it's much easier to release our command check than it is to release dev tools. Um, you know, technically dev tools probably shouldn't have any reverse dependencies, but it does. Um, because I think of it as like a workflow package, right? And so right. that's, it's an overstatement to say that it shouldn't have reverse dependencies, but it shouldn't, I don't think it should have as many as it does. Um, but regardless of that, um, you know, meta packages like that and things that have been around for a long time tend to like accrue sort of baggage. So um, it's easier to like innovate in a smaller package like our command check that you can release more frequently. So there were a variety of reasons for, and then also you can hand those off to like different people and share the work in a more structured way, which is easier than dev tools kind of being some like mono repo of all the package development stuff or whatever. Makes sense. Um, how about, uh, like, I think Gargle, was that more of your personal decision? Or not? Uh, <laughs> I think I was really inspired and kind of maybe voluntold to do it by Craig Citro at Google. So he was super helpful to talk to about Google things you know, long, like for years. And, you know, I, I connected with him at some R Open Sci uh, event a long time ago. And, and that was back when I was creating and maintaining this Google, the original Google Sheets package, which I now I'm like, okay, I can't believe it even worked. Um, <laughs> but so I talked to him a lot leading up to writing like Google Drive. Um, and so he shared that he had this fantasy that within Google, he would be able to provide some function for their R users and that it would just like magically off, right? <laughs> that it would just sort of figure out for most people, most of the time, how like a, what a decent way to off for them. And so then he wrote like a proof of concept function for that and then got permission to open source it or whatever. And so then like that became the gargle package, this like one function. <laughs> and then and then I was like, oh, I get it. I see what you mean. Like there's these, you know, cause I was still like learning off at that point. But so that was like concrete enough for like the light bulb to go on. And I'm like, okay, I understand. And then like, I can flesh this out now and then once I fleshed it out I can like wire it back into my other packages that have their own homegrown versions of doing this and so it was really like taking a really nice idea that he had and then fully realizing it so very cool I I, I mean I, it works that way that it just works like you don't have to think about that was that was so. that was really the design goal like that was almost it 
which is like how hard it cannot be that hard to take a really good guess at how this person <laughs> wants to authenticate. Yeah, we should be it, able it, to do that. <laughs> I have uh, I've done work on like packages that need auth, and it's painful both as a user and a developer. So making it yeah, easy for the it's user just is hard nice. area. <laughs> well, and certainly and people still experience a lot of pain with gargle when when they have a somewhat exotic need or whatever and it all works but you, then you do have to read docs and that's a big yeah. drag and <laughs> a lot of the concepts like people they don't have like a an ongoing need to understand the different types of oauth right and so then even if they read it it doesn't make sense and it, so so once you get to a point where like just letting it happen doesn't work it you know it's just painful like like all the other packages are I have I have a user account that's uh, that's working with Gargle. I don't remember how I set it up, but I did, and it's it yeah, just works I think now. That's so very typical, <laughs> very typical. Uh, all right, so kind of similar or to to the stories we were exploring is what was the first R package? I'm going to split this one. It's what was the first R package you worked on, and then like that you worked on professionally. All right, the first R package that I worked on, and there was another question here that this, this answer is the same. Oh. Where was it? Something about a package that never saw the light of day. Oh, okay. I can't remember. I saw something, you know, that, that like. Oh, there it is. Uh, what never personal made packages it have you developed <laughs> that haven't been submitted to CRAN? Yeah, so. yeah. So, so I think it's true to say that the first package I worked on, and something that never made it to Cran, it also never made it to anywhere public, was um, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but basically I was trying to write a static website generator. Hmm. So, um, this was like quite a long time ago, like firmly in my academic years, and before I had any notion that I wasn't going to stay there. And I just, I just felt like I couldn't sort of organize uh, the way I communicated with the diff like my students and like staying up to date on their projects and maybe collaborating on analyses and like GitHub, like this was like a long time ago. I mean, GitHub <laughs> existed, but it wasn't nearly as popular as it is now. And it's like, we weren't all marinating <laughs> in it, sorry. No problem. Hopefully it will not last long. <laughs> Go get a job. Um, so I had this idea, like I should be able to write R and Markdown files and then that should be able to create a, a website and like that could be automated. And, and, and I, there probably were static websites anyway, but so I wrote something really kind of half-assed and <laughs> it never like kind of used it like internal to my little group or whatever. But I think that would be the first package that I ever worked on. That was probably the first time where I forced myself to cross that line from being someone who writes R scripts, which is what I was for a very long time to like, all right, this is a great opportunity <laughs> to like package something. All right, and then how about the first one you worked on, well, I guess we can do two steps. What was your first one that went to CRAN? Do you? I think Google Sheets. Okay. I think. And were, was that when you were teaching, or was that? Yeah, with our that was. So now that all started just as a professor. <laughs> um. Yeah. Which, you know, is the quality of the code inside reflects <laughs> that I was like pretty early in my journey. So I got it to work, but mm. there's just, there were all sorts of very regrettable decisions. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but that's I okay, you know, is, I yeah. think everybody goes through something. <laughs> well, and like, it's nice that you, you know, when you have something like, okay, it's the new version of the API, uh, the Google API. So I'm going to make a new version of the package and it lets you have that it clean just break. It's such a be beautiful opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <to be> like, <laughs> I'm going to burn this all down and start <laughs> over. Like it's not fixable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have a question that's gotten a couple of votes here now. 
are there any particular packages that you would recommend like studying to learn good coding practices? Uh, are there any whose source code is well written and a good example for beginners? So of course I'm I'm like very <laughs> biased. So I'm gonna give what's probably an expected answer, which is <laughs> I would focus on something written by the Tidyverse team. Like yeah, okay, that's my answer. Other people get different <laughs> answers. Uh, I know that I, you know, so I wrote this package Google Sheets right as a professor. It wasn't clear what would come of it, or I thought I would just stay being a professor, but at some point I realized I really would be interested in writing software full time. And at that point, I did start to read a lot of other people's package code. And the person whose code I read the most of was Hadley for sure, like on maybe exclusively. <laughs> um, and that was before like there was any notion that I would work for him. Um, and so like if I were making that kind of decision today, I would still, I would pick a package that Hadley wrote. I'll just be like <laughs> totally <laughs> honest, but like, I think you might expect me to, to say that. Um, and then I think within the tidyverse that four cats is mm. kind of magical in that like, it's a real package. It does real stuff. It's <laughs> totally worth having, but it's also, it's not like astronaut stuff, right? It's, it's pretty down to earth. Um, I don't think there's any compiled code in it. So you won't have that frustrating experience. I could be wrong. I don't think I am though. Um, I was like, oh, I'm just starting to understand how this, oh, and then you see it just goes to C++ or something, right? That's, that's a terrible feeling. Um, so I think four cats is probably a good one for, it's not like super exotic, doesn't do like a lot of exotic stuff inside. Um, I think st string R is also has some of that because like the heavy lifting there is done by stringy. Right. Really, and string R is kind of finessing a lot of interface issues. Um, so that's pretty interesting. I've noticed that working on the R packages book, when we need to give a clean example of a function or how to write an example or how to write a test, like string R comes up a lot as hmm. like, oh, that's a that's a good example. Um, so it seems to have some very favorable combination of like, it's not a toy by any stretch right. of the imagination, but it is understandable. Um, I don't know if people want to nominate <laughs> other, like I can tell you what not, it's not easy. Like dplyr is not easy to read having tried. Um, there's just like a lot going on. Like to make something yeah. sort of feel that simple on the outside means there's all sorts of not simple stuff going on, on the inside. It's, yeah, I was um, gonna say it's all it's all methods and then methods that call C plus plus. Yeah, code, yeah. You're right? like, where so, is the stuff actually <laughs> happening? You know, <laughs> and yeah. So I think fair enough. Yeah. So within the tidyverse, um, I think. I think four cats and string are are good candidates because it's like pretty easy to understand like what are we trying to do with this function um and then mostly when I've dipped in there it's pretty easy to follow I don't know yeah, if other I, people encountered other packages that they kind of enjoyed enjoyed reading feel free to speak up um I know personally I uh I participated in the Tidyverse Dev Day in uh, 2019 and added a function or two into String R. And it, exactly what you're saying that I didn't actually have to like do much like logic because Stringy does all the all the fancy stuff, but it's the String just R is getting everything pretty prepared. And, yeah, and so that is a there are probably still issues there that are relatively low hanging fruit if you want to kind of like learn how things work because the issues tend to be, you know, this argument that's in stringy, can we have this in string R? And then there'll be a note from Hadley saying, oh yeah, that'd be nice, you know, or something like that. And so 
if you find one of those, that's a fairly easy one to to yeah. kind of wet your teeth. I don't know how many of those are left, but that's basically what yeah, I Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at like the tidyverse, you know, the core tidyverse and everything that gets installed by tidyverse. And I stand by like string R and four cats, I think are the obvious candidates for, like if you're not going in with the purpose, with the goal of like, I'm gonna fix a bug, um, but you're like, I'm gonna try to absorb principles by osmosis and like style and, you know, what would Hadley do? Well, I would read this package and then try to, you know, back, re like reverse engineer the, the sort of taste or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously there are other great package developers who do not work anywhere near <laughs> me. And, but like the ones where I can give the most concrete advice are the ones in my local neighborhood. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think like if I'm trying to, um, like if I need to to do something with HDTR or HDTR2, for example, like when I first wanted to learn HDTR2, I think the way I looked at it was look at the reverse depends on CRAN for HDTR2 and look for a package that is like a tidyverse package or, you know, buy someone who is more prominent in the community and then look at that code because that'll show you how like how you're meant to interface with that other package. So I think kind of thinking through what you want to do and then what, you know, what is the path? What is something that's doing something similar? And that, that reminds me of um, being an effective searcher of source on GitHub is like a total <laughs> superpower <laughs> that, that does not get talked about nearly enough. That there's so many questions I hear in different forums where I'm like, let me, let me GitHub search that for you, you know, <laughs> like, and, and so like really try to make a conscious effort to think about like, could I shed some light on this by seeing other people using the same function in the wild? Like, so people don't do that nearly enough. Um, so I highly recommend signing up. I think that there, the new GitHub code search, I think it's still in beta. Like it's really easy to get into the beta. Like I think you just go anyway. I think maybe it was a little difficult at the beginning, but um, so the new search interface is definitely worth signing up for and learning. And it's not hard to learn. Um, and you know, just knowing to you know function name, path colon r slash star, org colon tidyver. You know. <laughs> Like, like you can get really narrow really fast. Um, is like, a, and then you suddenly get like ten hits in front of you, and it's just like wild caught examples of somebody using this function you're interested in to solve a real problem. Um, it's like so effective. Um, yeah, I do a lot, a lot <laughs> of GitHub code searching. Another like kind of under appreciated package. It's a little more special purpose is package search, P-K-G-S-E-A-R, you know, search, package search. Um, but I have definitely used it, um, like sometimes in use this development and especially am working on the R packages book, I will have some assertion like lots of our developers do X. And then I'm like, how do I know that? Like, like it's just an opinion that I have, like maybe I should check it. Um, or I, you know, I believe that like, so that our group maintains something like 200 packages and I will have an opinion about, you know, what, what the URL field in our packages should look like, right? So, you know, something like that. And so then I might want to, search into all of our packages for certain things. So, you know, sometimes I use the GitHub API, some sort of questions where I feel like I'm sort of studying the ecosystem package search is very useful. GitHub code search is very useful, but often if you're doing something, you know, kind of researchy or bleeding edge, like no one has written a blog post <laughs> about it, right? Like you're gonna have to kind of go to the original sources which is like the corpus of our code on GitHub. 
Um, and the, you know, the existence of the CRAN GitHub organization, which is not, has no official association with actual CRAN, but rather reflects the source code of every package that is on CRAN. Um, also super useful in GitHub searches because you can be like org colon CRAN. And it means like, I wanna find every instance of somebody using this function in a CRAN package. Like if you're having trouble seeing how to use it or how to use it in a CRAN compliant way, right. you know? Um, so that that organization is extremely helpful for like filtering GitHub code search. So I think all of these searching methods um, like are so powerful for for figuring out like who else is doing this and like how do they do it? <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. I, I I definitely do the like digging through CRAN or sorry digging through GitHub to find like how, or digging through just the code of a package to see how are they doing this? How is this working um, when I want to do something? And again, you know, with people who want to get involved in open source, uh, you know, contribute contributing to open source. Uh, so many things have been, I look at how this works and I look at the docs and like, hey, the, this, this didn't actually explain that. Or I'm playing with this and this error message doesn't actually match what, you know, like it didn't tell me I had to do a lot more work to figure out what that error message meant. So if you just can contribute a fix for that, usually that is something that package uh, maintainers very much appreciate, a documentation yeah. fix or a clearer error message. Um, and it's a way to kind of learn the code and learn GitHub and all those things. So um, I'm a big fan of doing that. I, yeah, I'm now a contributor are, on R7. Those can be like so. easy to merge because it, it doesn't, <laughs> right. It doesn't have the ambition of like changing the way the package behaves, right? So like the <laughs> right. stakes are lower. Um, so yeah, uh, when I saw Hadley's talk coming up for uh, about R seven, um, the one at um, uh, Usar, it's like what the heck's R seven? I went and played with it, and the error message that I got the first like the first thing I ran, it's like I don't know what that error message means, and so. I dug through and figured out what the error message meant and then submitted a PR. And so now I'm a contributor on this brand new uh, R7 thing. So. <laughs> That's cool. Because um, <laughs> I wanted to understand I mean, how the er heck this thing works. So Error messages are a huge part of your user interface, right? Yeah, I mean, right. you'd like to think they aren't, but they, <laughs> they are. <laughs> well, so, uh, so we touched on the CRAN area and there are a few questions here if you don't want to go into that that is fine but there are questions about you know what's your opinion on our, on our universe maybe replacing cran um I, I know that we had some other should tidy miles tidyverse and our lib have their own cran task views or similar and if if the latter um should that be something that posit does so do you have any thoughts on all the the cran stuff <laughs> i do i do <laughs> You want to some, share of which I, some of which I feel like I can express uh, in a way that is appropriate for this setting. Um, like one of the things that I think is incredibly valuable about our universe, other than the project, not our universe, like our dash <laughs> universe, um, is it's it's showing people that sort of there are lots of ways to achieve a lot of the things that people have historically thought like only CRAN could provide. And, and in particular that there's a lot of modern tooling that like really stacks up against some of those tasks like very well. And it makes like a lot of sense um, to automate these things in these ways and to put it in the cloud in these ways and to make the code that does the things visible. And like, there's just so many aspects of what our universe is doing that I love as basically like proving like this can be done with a, an open toolkit. Um, and so, I mean, the, the big, question is I still don't see how a graceful transition to like both 
existing and being regard, you know, it would CRAN accept packages, uh, well, dependencies on packages that were living elsewhere, like currently, no, that's only Bioconductor, right? That has that privilege. So I think we're in a difficult place. And I would love to say I'm like really optimistic about some sort of gradual transition to something else, but um, I don't see that. So like, I don't, I end up feeling like there's gonna have to be some sort of cataclysmic event that like causes a phase shift. And that's that's just like my conclusion from the outside. And this particular problem is one that I do not choose to like beat my head against. <laughs> um, so I try to be a productive contributor within the confines of our current ecosystem. But yeah, I don't think all is well. Um, and it just doesn't feel like it can possibly carry on like this forever. <laughs> Right, and so the question is, can people find a graceful way to gradually start changing or is it going to take something kind of like speeding off a cliff and then, I don't know. But um, yeah, it just, it feels like it just doesn't scale and it doesn't sustain with this, you know, the exact model that we have now. It's amazing that packages ever get released like it's you know it's just i don't i'm not sure how many of them there are that are cran you know like the reviewers of cran um but i'll That's say secret that, information yeah and the uh the first package i submitted to cran i had seen all the stuff you know people talk about the horrors of cran and it wasn't bad I have had other ones where like you get a comment back that's yelling at you and it's like I didn't I'm sorry I didn't mean to do anything wrong um yeah <laughs> it's an interesting uh, situation well and I, I would like to say like in addition to our universe kind of showing all sorts of concrete interesting things that like other ways to you know, create binaries, run tests on different platforms, you know, like that, that all of that uh, can be done uh, by the by the community and with other tools. Right. Um, you know, Bioconductor is another extremely, extremely relevant example of, um, you know, they still have a, a their own version of our command check. They have quality they are they review right you can't just submit it's not like pi pi or something right where you just send it off and it's on there um but they have a completely open process for that so you know when you submit a version i think it all sort of basically unfolds like a github pr or issue so like the whole conversation is public um i think that would be much healthier uh so there, there i think there are lots of interesting ideas that have been proven to work well in some of these other spaces. And I'd, I'd love to see us adopt them <laughs> in our main repo repository. Is there, um, is there tooling around making the process easier? Like, you know, uh, DevTools has stuff around submitting to CRAN. Is there stuff around submitting to Bioconductor or submitting eventually maybe, you know, getting things into our universe and making sure that you're going to make everyone happy. Is that, does any of that uh, exist? About, about the Bioconductor thing, I am sure there is, <laughs> and it's kind of, I'm embarrassed that I don't exactly know the yeah. answer to that question, but so I'm sure that if someone were listening, they'd be like, oh, 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 <laughs> yeah, know, it's, it's this. So, so yeah, I would assume so. Yeah. I know there is a package called BioC this um, that does some use this e stuff that probably I think it helps people kind of set things up the way Bioconductor wants them to. Like they have a very specific idea about vignettes. And so like it does what I would say are use this e tasks, which is really <laughs> about putting files in the right place. <laughs> Mostly right. about putting files in the right places. Um, so I don't know if there's a bioconductor equivalent of DevTools release or DevTools submit CRAN, but there probably is. 
Okay. And then as for submitting to... things to our universe, I think it's like you just do your you thing right, right? and then yeah. you sort of connect yourself up as a user. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know like right now um, in my, my day job, we have, I mean, I don't know, it's a rule among like me and the other guy who kind of manages everything with, for our stuff of we have stuff we write and we have stuff that's on CRAN and maybe development versions of things that are on CRAN that that's an easy bar of this is what this is like the minimum that we need to trust the thing but I don't know I don't know why we use CRAN as any part of that it's just a thing that is what we do and I think that's a lot of like I think a lot of people I mean, there is that. a tremendous yeah. amount of value from like not every language like most most do not have an analog of our command check like we are right. so lucky <laughs> that like our base language has this capability of doing like at least an like an integrity check it doesn't you know it's not telling you anything about quality or well something's well written or whatever but but that it like meets certain behavioral standards is still like huge That's and true. knowing that it can be built and installed on multiple platforms <laughs> is huge and then the like constantly checking that the ecosystem makes sense with each other right that this That's, thing doesn't yeah. break that thing that also has tremendous tremendous value <laughs> That's true. Um, so we get a lot from those aspects of what CRAN does. I think the part that's just starting, you know, not, not just starting, like it's just so, so difficult and problematic really is like developer relations. Right, fair enough. All right, so let's go back into more um, uh, of development style questions. So we have one and I don't like to ask the, you know, what was the most? So what was a challenging test that you can think of that you had to write for a package and how did you approach and solve that problem? If there is anything you can remember. Well, I hate writing tests that touch on encoding problems. Oh God. Right, yes. because it, feel, it feels like, what's that, um, you know, that famous like sort of physics thing about so-and-so's cat, like, is it in the box? Is it not in the mm. box? Or like, when you're working with encoding problems, I feel like every way that you want to inspect your specimen uh, is also being filtered through like your OS and like base R like loves to like mess with encoding, you know? And so just even feeling like you can observe the actual thing. And so you end up having to like, do everything with like Unicode escapes and yep. doing a lot of like byte, byte by byte comparisons and all these things. So, so anytime I see an issue that I can tell is an encoding problem, I just hear this like sad trombone sound in my head. Cause I'm like, oh, I hate, I hate solving <laughs> these. And like, I am getting better at it. I do once I decide to do it, I do always solve it, but it's like very painful. So fixing it is hard, but then writing the tests that guarantee you've fixed it and that it stays fixed. I find that particularly hard for encoding problems. Um, then also having worked a lot on read Excel, a lot of things, a lot of bugs you try to fix are tickled by a file you can't create, right? Like yeah. the the universe created some like bizarre <laughs> Excel file and like apparently Excel can open it. So people expect read Excel to be able to read it. But so usually in a test, right? Like you wanna be able to create the test object with whatever pathology you're hardening yourself against run your function and then make sure you get the right output. But so it is very frustrating when your test objects are Excel files because you usually, you, had, you cannot create stuff this weird. So when you're fixing that kind of bug, you have to create tests that test against these weird examples that the universe provided to you. So like 
read Excel has this folder of horrors, which are just like strange spreadsheets that have come across the desk that are hard to read. And we've you know, made them readable. And then you have to like leave a test in place where you keep reading. You know, I have like this very specific Russian spreadsheet from a Catherine Berg, <laughs> like it's famous to me now. Um, so those are hard. And then writing tests, um, writing tests around APIs is a huge yeah. dilemma, right? Because, you know, either you have to mock everything, which has its own set of problems, or you don't, but then you're kind of testing your own code and somebody else's code and service at the same time. So I think those are three classes of tests that come come up repeatedly for me and that always give me a small sense of dread. <laughs> I've got uh, API tests. Uh, um, that's my one of my current requests is to learn yeah. how to mock better and when to mock and how to how to make sure I'm still also checking that the API still works the way I think it works. And all right. Um so let's see. So that I, I poked everyone in the chat to go uh, vote things up. And the one that came to the top is, uh, what tips do you have for package developers to make more informative error messages? This, this might wrap so, it up. We'll so, so I think, all right, I'm trying to get a link. Yeah. So there's this website, um, design.tidyverse.org which is, I think maybe it's like some early version of what would eventually become another book Hadley might write. <laughs> but it has, you know, yep. it has value in its current state, but it's it's certainly not some like fully baked thing. Um, oh wait, is it here? Yeah, so there's, if you look at the sort of table of contents, error call, error constructors, um, there's some information there that I think reflects a lot of our aspirations. I think actually what <laughs> I'm really thinking about is style.tidyverse.org. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, that was some relevant content, but that's <laughs> air. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think I'm more want to put a plug in for the tidyverse <laughs> style guide error messages. Um, I think a lot of what's here does constitute what makes a good error message. I mean, I think the key part, the thing that drives me wild with errors is when something fails and you know that whoever threw the error knew where the problem was, but they don't tell you, right? They're just like, sorry, there's a problem, but you're like, well, which line or like which row or like which element, you know? Um, so I think that you know the key principle is trying to make the error code the error um, actionable, like that a motivated user has a prayer of being able to figure <laughs> out what's wrong and fixing it. So, um, so that yeah, it really means the style tidyverse.org, not the design. I mean that other thing's interesting. Um, is important. Like tell people. You know, I think some of it must be inspired by by the the way people write specs. You know, like you must not do this. You cannot do this. Element I violates that. You know, like but to try to to be like super crisp and precise so that maybe people can fix their own problem. Um, and it turns out that often that means you have to like thread information through functions where you previously had not kind of passed all those details like there's some deep internal helper and then when all is well that helper does not need to know which piece of data it's working on but if that helper is going to throw the error for bad data it does need to know which element it's working on or it's not allowed to throw an error it has to like return an error code and it has to bubble up to somebody who knows which piece of data <laughs> we're working on, right? But so it this does this can be like kind of hard to apply retroactively to a package. 
right. um, that it turns out like the information you need to give a great error message is often not available locally. <laughs> and so that that's like, hmm. <laughs> and so you have to pass it down. Uh, and then mechanically, I think, I think Arlang, and then in particular, CLI abort, which is technically in the CLI package. So it combines like the goodness of CLI with Arlang. Um, like we're, we're pushing like really hard to force ourselves to convert our error messages to using that function um, because it also like, it really helps you be consistent with formatting. And if something's uh, a file path, it gets styled in a way that it's kind of obvious it's a file path. Like, and that turns out it's important. Like if you're working on a package and somehow it was called package, if, if people don't use punctuation or some other clue that like, this is the name of the thing versus this is a noun, um, error messages can actually be very confusing. So I think styling things well, like if it's code, back ticket or like formatted as code, if it's a function, put parens at the end, like all of that stuff helps people understand error messages a lot. So anyway, I think that those, those global <laughs> principles of try to, try to help the user identify and solve their own problem. And then mechanically, I think CLI abort is the way to go. But with the like acknowledgement that it can be hard to deliver all the information that user really wants. And so sometimes you have to do quite a bit of surgery later to pass yeah. it down. I think something that the tidyverse and whatever tidyverse adjacent packages i think are better at than a lot of things is you know you you do like you say you like you tell the user what's wrong versus telling like the computer what's wrong that a lot of error messages are are just this thing failed you know this this variable that is 12 layers deep and you have no idea what that variable is is the wrong type and you're like, well, I don't have anything named X. What do you mean yeah. X is yeah. an integer? Yeah, so. so that's certainly like an aspiration. I'm sure we still have a ton <laughs> of errors that do that. But so we've started to do like an upkeep week every quarter, every six months. And we literally have a function and use this that opens a GitHub issue with a checklist of things. And it, and it, it adapts to you know when the package was last released so that it doesn't make you do like ancient history stuff you've already done. Um, and like the meatiest thing in our re most recent upkeep week was error messages. And you know, of course we couldn't we could not get to them all, but we we do we are like we have a general push <laughs> right now to like get the error messages kind of up to snuff everywhere. But that's like a long and very ongoing effort. <laughs> I, I think I found um, the function. So I've always actually, I'm gonna, we're at time, but, but you made me uh, look at this function. All these tidy functions, like, do you advise people or do you think people things like use it use tidy github actions should people who are not tidy developers use these would do that do we get value out of these so that one in particular i think as it's like no sorry not call, github actions you, that's not what i meant oh I meant okay the uh, upkeep there it is i copy pasted the wrong yeah, one that, that see, one that one that one um well it'll be a mix <laughs> of stuff that is relevant to other people and that is not. But I would say most of it would be interesting for most people to contemplate. Um, I don't think there's a ton of tidyverse specific stuff there. Unlike what you brought up first, use tidy GitHub actions, which is gonna like burden your repo with probably like a way too <laughs> onerous um, CI matrix. But I think you, Use tidy upkeep issue. I think a lot of package devs would probably find it interesting to call that function and just like look at what what 
the checklist says and then yeah you know take or leave some of them but it would be like an interesting set of like things to be like oh I don't do that oh I had no idea that was a thing um and there could be a few things that are specific to us I think I I think I try to detect that though I know in some places I try to detect like is this does this package have a url and does the github url <laughs> tell me that it's below this organization and i like tailor the advice accordingly i can't remember how much this function does does of that um i'm just looking it it doesn't look like you check in that one whether it's a tidy package tidyverse package but you do do some checking on like, can you push to this um, repo? Yeah. Um, well, the <laughs> origin of some of those tests is like when I've been developing stuff and use this and like I've accidentally opened issues <laughs> on, like I was just like playing with someone's package and I'm like, sorry, sorry. I, I did not mean to open like a release issue in your repository. So then I was like, I should prevent people from opening this. <laughs> in a repository they can't push to because like you know you can open issues in any public repo but <laughs> so those, those are usually born of some like mild embarrassing thing i did once and then <laughs> try to make it well, possible to do that again i think i think that's why i love use this because that, that's what everything feels like is that it's just we try like, to it, avoid it public embarrassment yeah yeah and it's just it's it's all practical um it's trying like you have a uh you have UI oops. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. having internal functions like that that um just show the kind of the what you're looking for. Um this has been great. Um our time is up, but uh you know, we will have future cohorts and I would love to uh get you back for another one sometime. Yeah, okay. um, this will be up on YouTube tomorrow or so and um we'll see if we get any like new questions and you know people can come to to our slack and discuss them um, and so we didn't really talk about the book at all uh, yeah. so i do want to reiterate those of you who just read it and like with the giant caveat that i i apologize that like the ground was changing from underneath you <laughs> and continues to um you know, if you found stuff that's like wrong or this super confusing or whatever, please do open an issue because it's all getting worked on right now. Um, yep, so yeah, sure. I just want to take this chance of people <laughs> who have recently walked through it. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's uh, good news that they didn't have any questions specifically about the book. It was more no, about but usually I think it's people are shy or they're like, oh, <laughs> so I want to I want to like encourage you Push to. Uh, yes. No, for sure. Uh, we have done uh, like with tiny models that just came out, we did a lot of a um, lot of discussion and issues and fixes on that one that were incorporated like um they yeah. changed the order of the book based on some of our feedback so um definitely if you had anything yeah, that was confusing people, people reading an in development version and like sharing you know this is really weird you know it's like <laughs> super super helpful because like we're at a point now where we could actually do something about it but once it like gets frozen you can't or you, then you're talking about i don't know if there will be a third edition but so right. now is a great time to speak out yeah it's it's always interesting to see immediately after it goes off you know final version goes to print that's when you see a bunch <laughs> of issues come in so of course get them in before that while yeah they can yeah that's when things. you turn that's when you turn issues off for a while <laughs> I, yeah a more a moratorium for like a month so that there's um, less heartbreak for sure. So yes, everyone, yeah, everyone storm and report less. No, don't report like a million issues. But if there's anything that that was confusing, definitely uh, let them know. Um, it has been really interesting to see uh, the things come through of hey, um, like the first one I can remember from this latest wave was um, Hadley like rewrote the license chapter and was like, hey, I 
totally changed this. What does everyone think? And so he'll do that on Twitter. So um, those of you who have just read it might want to watch for those kinds of things of, hey, has anything changed? Um, oh, that's so much clearer than what we thought before. Or maybe, you know, maybe you thought the original way of saying it was clearer. So um, yes, uh, we will, pro like I said, we'll probably do another cohort soon. Um, and if you are watching this or are here and are interested in another cohort, let me know and we'll get one started. Um, so again, thank you so much. Uh, oh, this is fun. It it was great to have you. And um, I like, you know, we could go on for hours because we still have, you know, we, we keep getting we more questions in. So. For a future. <laughs> for future sure. And, and I don't know what Slido is going to do with these questions, but we'll see. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. All right. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>